definitely enjoyed that. Got my exercise in for the day as well. <sighs> And uh, definitely could not use the mouse, so I had to find out <laughs> that spacebar indeed was the press play button, and then the next clip, apparently that was tab, but... I mean, <laughs> Purge never had these problems. Purge is also not here. Yeah, Brian is here. Yeah. I think Brian's done a really good job, Carl. I, I, mean, think, I, I think so, yeah, too. Yeah. Besides, he put wait, in the effort on his Carl, outfit Wait, well. Carl, when's your weatherman? Yeah, Kyle. Wait, isn't he doing it for the, the Secret vs. No. Enigma series as well? I'm and not Brian's on panel? Yeah, then don't flame Brian then, Yeah, Kyle. otherwise we're going to get you extra work. Yeah, on the weatherman. Purchase there for a secret versus The thing is, you know what, it yeah, doesn't matter true. what Brian does, he looks good doing it. I think that's what's most Oh, no, look at him now, he's just backpedaling. Oh, he's back pretty. Paddling. Shame, I'm, I'm Kyle. I'm just trying to support All my right. colleagues. Banana slam. Shame. I'm also very curious uh, to hear what uh, BSJ made of this. And we actually got BSJ with us in the studio right over there. Hey, this is not quite as far away from you guys as last time. Uh, so for this game, I am going to be talking about what I believe to be the two crucial moments uh, for Team Bald. And that's uh, first off the smoke gank that led to the Roche. And we're going to show the mini map and we're going to see that all the dire team is spread out. There's plenty of time it would take for them to get here as five. But what problem is, is that we're gonna start the smoke gang. This has to be clean. It has to be quick. They find a support, they break the smoke, and yet they use the ink swell and the Yules at the exact same time. This gives all the Dire Squad two and a half seconds to get there, allows them to counter initiate. Tide gets the time he needs to walk behind them, and suddenly you have a team fight that goes from a smoke gank in their favor, most likely going to catch a support right at the start. Support has the buy back, snap fire you already sees back in the fight, and it just turns out to be a complete disaster for Team Bald, going four for zero and turning that into a rush. Up until that point, the game was completely even. And we're going to see here once again that what High Coast, or er, Chicken Fighters, is doing is that they are threatening the high ground while also pushing in the mid lane. So what Team Bald sees on the minimap, if we show this again, is that they don't necessarily see a hard commitment to the high ground, so they're not prepared to defend yet. So we're gonna now see them TP in one at a time. And once again, they're gonna ink swell at the same time that he's ready to retreat. And we're just seeing a lot of miscoordination coming out from the Radiant team, and they're just instantly ready to punish on the side of chicken fighters. And both these, one leads to the Roche and a four for zero wipe, and the next one leads for a massive team wipe with three buybacks and a lost racks. And so next game going into it for Team Ball, I'm going to look for them to pick maybe not heroes like Grimstroke that require a lot of synergy. You guys are all individually great players. You just don't have enough practice as a team yet. And just, yeah, simplify your game plan, kind of like TGov said. Sounds like uh, some good tips there that hopefully Team Ball Reborn will take into consideration as they move to the second game of this best of three. Uh, we're going to listen to Brian, and he's going to talk to us about uh, why Chicken Fighters won this game. Right, Brian. Well, I'm going to do my absolute best, guys, as I'm, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm a huge fan of these little mechanics that you run into that sometimes you don't fully understand. And we're going to go into this first one where Charlie is going to seemingly have a kamikaze catapult. And what you're going to see is that he's going to briefly step into tower range right there, which he's going to take that one hit. Then the catapult's going to say, oh, got to go into tower range. And what his response is going to be is to walk himself and tank for it. So this is something you guys have to be careful of. If your catapult ever aggroes itself into tower range like that, that you can tank for it and make sure it stays alive to keep the push going. As we go into the next clip, where I learned this one myself during this game, uh, when Snapfire, her E actually refreshes itself every time you attack. So what Zibbe is going to do is attack five times, as you see the tower's armor is minus seven, and he's going to wait to refresh it as you see here on the on the debuff bar, and that's gonna get the max minus armor and build a bit of tower pressure that I thought was really cool, just in case you guys are seeing this. He had his skill build be 114. And then we're gonna see the last team fight where we kind of saw, or not the last team fight, but the start of the beginning of the end, uh, that is for Team Bald, where we're gonna see a bit of a lack of coordination again. They're finishing the Roche, and we're gonna see Lion initiate right over here, and we're gonna see uh, the Hoodwink ready to follow it up with the ulti, but yet Gork is going to run himself out while the rest of his team is running in. And now we just have a lot of chaos where the Lone Druid's gonna go down before anything else is happening. And the Juggernaut with Aegis does not have ultimate. He wants to participate in this fight, but it's already too late. And now Chicken Fighters is gonna be chasing them down. This is, what happens in these games has been that these early deaths 
in the team fight lead to a snowball of more and more deaths. As we see the coil onto two, they get the four man stun from the hoodwink, but it's just not enough. As a Roche that have originally went towards the way of Team Bald actually resulted in a four for zero and inevitably the end of the game in favor of chicken fighters. And uh, Brian is actually uh, gonna get a little bit into the heads of the players. Right, Brian? Is that it? That is what it is, Shiver. So for this game, I thought there was just a really funny clip where you always wonder, how is this actually happening in the Dota game? So I wanted to show you guys real quick uh, an explanation for some of these weird things. So what we're gonna see here is an attempt for Omni Knight to, excuse me, is it gonna play? Nope. Can we get it? Oh, am I getting assistance? Oh no. I broke it, guys. You want me to press it over there? Yeah, press it over there. That'd be perfect. Production value of the play. No, no. Okay, Shiver's, yeah, Shiver's going to help us out, guys. We got Shiver assistant in the back here. So what we're going to see is an attempt at D-Ward, where as a support, you place the sentry on the high ground, but we're going to show the range of the sentry that it's actually going to miss the ward on the side. And so what happens here is because from their perspective, they've de-warded, there's going to be absolutely no vision in this area. As we go to the next clip where Shiver's going to push spacebar on her computer. I think she hears me. Per oh. This is a disaster. Oh, it's working now. It's working now. Okay. So what I, the clip I wanted to show <laughs> is the fact that Put9 was able to snipe three couriers and you're wondering why they're letting this happen. And this is the ward that you see right here that's still left over from five or six minutes ago where Nine sees all of these couriers just running through. It's a courier hunting season as Nine has all the information he needs to be able to play down here. And you may think, why are they letting him snipe these couriers? And the fact that they think this ward is gone makes it so that Nine has all the information that he has, but also they don't know that he has. And as I thank Shiver for running all the way back over, I pre I, <laughs> it wasn't good enough for them to take the game, but I really like diving into the heads of the players, and I hope you guys enjoyed going with me. <laughs> I definitely enjoyed that. And uh, that Beastmaster, again, it worked out really great. What's the story of the game? And Brian is going to talk to us more about that. And we are going to take a look at his left shoe. Brian, show us your left shoe. Oh, custom Jordans. We got ourselves an Ursa, one of the two heroes I can actually play Ooh, right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that close up. Shiver, shout out to you for that awesome throw. So this is going to be a meta update of sorts for everyone wondering exactly what's going on with this Beastmaster hero. So we see it happening in the late game where he's pelting people with axes, but how did we get there? That's the question. So we're gonna go into this first clip and you're gonna see how efficient Wish is. Uh, 640 into the game, he's gonna use his axes to get both camps. And so when he's able to not only farm one camp that's already stacked, he's also farming a second camp at the exact same time. And he's gonna stack it again here at the seven minute mark. And this is just something I don't think any hero in the game should really be able to do. As you see him stack it up, everyone loves the feeling and looking upon stacks upon stacks being farmed. As we move on to the next clip, we're gonna see him doing the exact same thing in the dire triangle where he's actually going to use his boar to stack the camp and then he's going to do the whole axe one camp and get the second camp in it by farming the big camp first. And then you're gonna see how he uses the axes from here to here to get both camps at once. So he's gonna pick up the bounty, refill his bottle, and it just farms too fast. So this is an ancient stack, and I promise you this is a different portion of the game as he's about to do the exact same thing. There's already another ancient stack. He's gonna go farm the big camp, rinse and repeat. And this just makes it so his timings are insanely fast. And what he gets to in this game is a 12 minute Ag Scepter, which leads to, instead of farming his own ancients, now we're trying to invade the opponent's ancients as they smoke up with this early Ags coming out from Wish, get the Aurora plus Silence, which amps up all the damage. He has the Silence from the Skyrath as well as the aura from the ET to buff up all of his damage. And you're gonna see, look at Sven's health bar. It just drops 400 damage plus from the axes and they're just going to take 
his stacks that was meant for the Sven. The economic damage done from this is too much to handle, and the pace of the game is just too fast. And uh, Ice Frog, please help us. <laughs> yeah, that Beastmaster, 12 minute axe. No comment. No comment. All right. <laughs> well, I know someone who definitely would like to comment on uh, how Level Up transitioned from their early advantage into the later stages of the game. It is none other than BSJ. Thank you, Shiver. So right now we're having the setup for a typical tier one top trade for Radiant to the tier one bottom trade for Dire. And this is something where if the game's more even, Level Up would be perfectly fine taking this trade. But we're going to see a really cool play coming out from LeBron where he's going to simply snap fire ulti the creep wave, which is going to stall the push for Into the Breach. And this is going to set up the next play where this allows the Enchantress to come all the way from top lane to collapse on the mid lane. And you notice how Cree, or, uh, Into the Breach, instead of taking the bottom tier one since he was stalled it out on LeBron, they're now trying to deal with this mid push. And they're gonna, this allows the Radiant team to force a fight exactly how they want it with this early 2K net worth lead at the 12 minute mark. They get the initiation, and this is a fight where even if it doesn't go well for them, they already got the tier one mid. So now we're sitting at a two for zero in terms of tower advantage going towards level up. So now that they have still have that bottom tier one tower, they've taken all the towers that they want on the side of level up. They say, we're now gonna build a wall on the bottom lane and you're never getting this tower. So as you're gonna see, we're gonna have Enchantress rotating all the way from mid walking straight down to bottom lane. We're having the creep, like the, the into the breach play here. This is all they have left. They need this tower because they need to open up the map when you have a carry like Weaver. So we see Noob uh, regening up in the fountain, preparing to fight. DNZ's already TP'd. Funnick's gonna stand in front to make sure that if somebody gets initiated onto, it's going to be him. So they are completely ready for anything Into the Breach does. And they know, since Lifesteal is completely free farming on the top half of the map, that as long as nothing happens in this game, they're perfectly content with the lead they have. And as you see, Into the Breach gets baited onto Funnick. They get the counter initiation from the clockwork onto the invoker and the snap fire is already at the ready lena's tping in after regening in the fountain and this is then not only going to be shutting down the move that into the breach had to get back into the game but they're going to get a couple kills and they're going to turn this into a tier one tower of their own which nets them three tier one towers to the zero of into the breach and really secures the mid game advantage that then spirals into the eventual victory Thank you, Brian. And yeah, that just, I mean, that was just a summary of superior movement and superior gameplay. The bounty rune change, like, helps, like, you're just getting so many runes <laughs> on this Viper. Yeah. You're spamming Q, hustling out some mangoes. It's a lot more Viper favored than I figured. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a tough mid lane for Atzantic. He was getting absolutely bullied. And Brian is going to talk to us more about that one. Thank you, Shiver. I know we've got the GLHF pledge going, but clearly into the or level up did not get the memo because Exantic got the treatment this game. As we're first going to check out LeBron at the three minute mark, we talk about the reliance of the mid laners on the runes, and he's going to go ahead and snap up, snatch up that three minute bounty rune away from Exantic, who he's also going to try to snipe his courier. Now, Exantic was fortunate enough that the courier barely makes it to him with the bottle, but this is just his only recovery mechanism. He's already countered by the Viper. He needs this bottle and he needs these camps. So we're gonna highlight this ward on the high ground here that sees Exantic's path exactly where he retreats from the mid lane. Cause at this point he cannot lane anymore. He cannot deal with the poison attack from the Viper. And we're gonna see that Noob is just gonna say, okay, let's ignore what's happening in my wave. I don't need to worry about the creeps I need to get. And he's gonna make sure he doesn't even get this little creep. Exantic is not allowed to get one creep at the small camp. So now we move to the bounty hunter who's taking part in the, in not taking part, excuse me, in the GLHF pledge as he is now looking to make sure when Exantic's courier has respawned that it does not get to him. We're then gonna take a brief look at the mini map and see that if Exantic wants to leave mid lane, one path up and one path down. There's a ward on each of them. All the camps he wants to farm in order to recover are under vision, or at least he has to walk through it. And now he's going to have a level six on the Viper, and they're already here. LeBron giving him the orb vision. We saw this in the game. Xantic's gonna try to TP out, but Bounty Hunter, he's not even there yet, but he's ready. And at this point, 
It's just gotten out of control. And Xantic's been thoroughly bullied. And now we got a little bonus clip that I just wanted to show where you may say, how does Funic not die here? They all end him. And the key is, I'm gonna slow it down for you, is the break on the Slark from the Nether Toxin. He is not getting any Essence Shift stacks from the Necrophos as he's hitting him. And because of that, the damage output from the carry is relatively overwhelming. He ends up popping his BKB later on in the fight. Funic lives with less than 200 HP, and that's just the nail on the coffin for game two and a nice series from Level Up. Thank you, Brian. Indeed, it's a, it was a great series from Love Love. They look solid. I know that earlier on we kind of mentioned what the top three was going to look like in this lower division. I think Level Up is going to try to uh, make us change our minds about that because they definitely play like they belong at the top. If you liked this video, please like, comment, subscribe to the YouTube channel, all that shenanigans, because at the end of the day, YouTube does care about that. You may not care about it, I may not care about it, but the YouTube algorithm does. So please do.